i can uh, put my hands down and say you are going to listen to the authority in larynx i know i know because i've been seeing uh, professor anthony from uh, he he was my ug ug classmate and also pg classmate and during his pg we all used to read scott brown so uh, we used to read scott brown and go but uh, he was one pg who used to read uh, bartsakis hugin mayers and uh, scott brown i think for every uh, thing like radiotherapy has got a book like that you used to read one book for all the books he used to verbatim say paperla also he used to say paperla one pg was very very well read believe me i i will not flatter anybody i don't want to at this age i don't have to and he also doesn't need anything like that but since i know him personally i am telling this uh from his pg days he has been a perfect thorough academician and today he is going to interview dr aishwarya who is a third year ms a uh, post graduate in madras medical college my i'm proud to say i am also from mmc and uh, professor anthony also is from mmc and uh, she is going to present a case of ca larynx and uh, without much ado over to you, the dawn of ent professor anthony thank you janagram uh, for your your kind words yes i am very happy to say that i am your uh, long time friend maybe one of the uh, um uh, longest friends we were and uh, we were we were together for a long time uh, uh, you were with me on all my first and uh, i was with you on all your your first like uh, i still remember our first total ringectomy and first maxectomy and things like that uh, thank you very much for being with me that when we used to do uh, in uh, I, i used to have uh, four bed nursing home uh, called trichy ent research center i started at the uh, very early age at around 29 something like that and uh, whenever i used to do a case of clr in so any uh, major case i used to call professor anthony and professor anthony uh, used to come all the way from chennai and we used to have a gala time after the case till night 1 o'clock 2 o'clock 3 o'clock nicely chat about our college days and then he used to go back those were that is the that golden, is the gala time golden days that is that is the gala time <laughs> chatting about college days yeah. yes and uh, i want uh, i have to congratulate aishwarya for uh, presenting this and she has recently 10 15 days back she has delivered a baby uh, and uh, congratulations aishwarya and with that she is she is uh, 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 eager enough to present the case and she is going for exams so Congratulations, Aishwarya. Thank All you. the best. Thank Start you. Presenting Start presenting your case. Start presenting your case. Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a case of CA larynx. So, a 65-year-old male, Mr. Saundra Pandian from Kanji Guram, working as a farmer, has come with a chief complaint of uh, voice change for the past one year and uh, difficulty in breathing for the past one month. So, history of presenting illness. the patient was apparently normal one year back after which he developed the complaint of voice change uh, so for hoarseness of voice which is insidious in why uh, which is uh, voice change can be addressed as uh, dysphonia right but uh, hoarseness is a characteristic voice uh, how do you define hoarseness so uh, harsh voice which is not uh, uh, cons- uh, characteristic of uh, the particular age or sex so oh, is a harsh discordant voice which is not characteristic of patient's age sex or character is called hoarseness a uh, female talking like a male is hoarseness and uh, the change of original voice become harsh is is hoarseness usually it is it is which is because of two things one is the increased thickness of the vocal cord or cross section of the vocal cord and second one is uh, due to the um, uh, uh, functional inability of the um, uh, superficial lam- uh, layer of lamina papyracea to move easily over the intermediate and deep layer right host of voice right present so which was uh, insidious in onset and gradually progressive in nature there is no aggravating or relieving factor So uh, 
complaints wait, of wait, wait 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 whenever you think of this for uh, a change of voice or, or think of hoarseness see you usually hoarseness comes uh, for every uh, upper respiratory tract infection when will you think the hoarseness is uh, significant so that you got to evaluate the patient when it is uh, progressive sir and also sir, duration. no relieving factor uh, duration duration more than three weeks uh, more than three weeks it got to be uh, evaluated right there are a lot of um, factors uh, which are all called the danger factors in the hoarseness what are all they when the hoarseness is progressive it's not it's not remitting second one is the uh, intermediate uh, time when the pain increases with the with the hoarseness which is a sign of uh, non remitting hoarseness third is associated dysphagia fourth is associated neck swellings fifth is associated aspiration so sixth is associated uh, is it occurs in smokers occurs in alcoholics occurs in the people who are exposed to the uh, 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 pollutant which is known to produce malignancies so all these things are all uh, risk factors so whenever you see a patient who has got a hoarseness along with that patient they have got odynophagia along with that patient they have got a um, uh, dysphagia loss of weight is an alcoholic is a smoker all these things are all danger points in a patient of a uh, hoarseness so keep this in your mind that uh, whenever you present a case of hoarseness all these things got to be presented at the approximate places okay so when you have a, a giddiness we take certain things as a uh, red flag signs like whenever there is a, a giddiness with the uh, headache giddiness with the um, uh, false localizing signs or a uh, nausea and vomiting or uh, uh, progressive giddiness we think there is any intracranial problem But similarly whenever you see an hoarseness with all the following things you got to always think of patient can have a sinister diseases it's not because of chronic laryngitis or because of a vocal polyp okay right complaints uh, of uh, difficulty in breathing for the past one month insidious in onset and gradually progressive in nature aggravated by uh, physical activity relieved by rest uh, it is not associated with noisy breathing okay so no okay. history of uh, difficulty in swallowing uh, no history of sore throat or throat pain no history of foreign body sensation in throat uh, no history of uh, aspiration uh, no history of uh, ear pain Uh, no history of uh, neck swelling. So these are all the things: history of aspiration, history of ear pain, uh, history of neck swellings. All these things are danger signs. Okay, so you got to keep those in your mind. Can you can you can you go to the previous slide? So no history of difficulty in swallowing. Okay, so when the patient has got a difficulty in in swallowing, what do you think of? this patient when you don't have a difficulty in swallowing you pinpoint a patient to one particular area okay we'll we'll see to that later uh, proceed uh a no history of ear discharge hard of hearing dizziness or uh, ringing sensation in ear uh, no history of uh, nasal obstruction nasal discharge headache facial pain or post nasal drip or bleeding from no, uh, nose or uh, no history of trauma there was history of loss of weight for the past one month and uh, history of loss of appetite for the past one month okay okay so uh, past history sir uh, patient is not a known diabetic uh, known hypertensive for the past 3 years and uh, uh, he is not a known uh, tuberculosis bronchial asthma epileptic epileptic patient a uh, history of uh, previous surgery for hydrocin 21 years back uh, no history of uh, any bleeding disorder previous blood transfusion or drug allergy okay a uh, personal history uh, mixed diet patient takes mixed diet 
he is a known smoker for the past 40 years average 10 bds per day uh, non alcoholic for the uh, past 40 years uh, normal bowel and bladder habits uh, when you call a patient alcoholic how much amount of alcohol taken uh, per day is called as alcoholic when they will ask you what are all the percentage of alcohol in various various drinks they will ask you what drink he takes so how much amount so or what is the, the percentage so whiskey brandy uh, rum so all these things contains a per certain percentage of alcohol content and then uh, beer and uh, and arak has got a different percentage of alcohol content. so when will you call a patient an alcoholic um, sir, uh, when he takes more than uh, uh, 180 okay. ml per day. Okay. So, no, it's not, it's not comes like that. When the patient has have a habit of taking an urge to take alcohol every day, and a person who takes alcohol, even if he is alone, is taken as an uh, <laughs> alcoholic. It's not a social drink. Okay. So, approximately, he takes about more than 90 ml of uh, uh, 90 ml of uh, standard alcohol per day is called uh, uh, an alcoholic. Okay, then. So, family history, uh, no other family uh, history of uh, any CA, uh, nil significant. Family history, nil significant. Okay. So, you think where the lesion is? Uh, sir, uh, glot is. Why? Uh, uh, there is uh, the presenting complaint is a uh, change in voice, sir. Okay. So, a person who gets main, that is, uh, main presenting complaint is change of voice, usually it got to be in the larynx. Okay. Why is not a supraglottic? So, a pa patient may have, may have a foreign body sensation. Uh, there will be a foreign body sensation. sensation. Second thing is, can, can, can I have dysphagia? The patient can have a soreness, rawness of the throat, and uh, neck swellings. These are all common. Okay, uh, but the neck swelling is very uh, not reasonably common in the glottic region. What, which, which region that uh, see larynx is common? Uh, glottis. What is the percentage? Rule of eight: eighty percent glottis. 8% subglottis, uh, uh, 35 to 40% is supraglottis. Okay, so commonest thing is glottis. What is the, uh, the patient doesn't have a neck nodes. When the patient doesn't have a neck nodes, most probably the, the disease is from the glottis. Because only 4% of the glottis growth patient will have a neck node compared with that of the other area. So 40%, uh, 38 to to 40% will be your uh, supraglottic tumor and 14% uh, will be your subglottic tumors. Okay. Um, uh, that is an, uh, then that's an another reason. So the, pay, the patient who has got a disease of um, uh, difficult, uh, disease of change of voice who don't have any other, uh, any other disease like um, uh, uh, any other disease, uh, any other symptom like um, difficulty in swallowing, pain during swallowing, or uh, uh, neck swelling, uh, and then uh, uh, so uh, this is the uh, this is the patient will have a usually laryngeal laryngeal tumor, probably at the level of the glottis. Okay, uh, why the patient has got a difficulty in breathing? Patient may go in for a compromised uh, airway, sir. Uh, then patient should have had a, had a strider. He said no noisy breathing. Maybe. We keep this in your mind. Maybe because of secondary lung. It can be because of aspiration pneumonitis. Uh, silent aspiration. So it can be because of unrelated other causes like cardiac causes or uh, 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 chest causes. So you keep that in your mind and most probably there may be extension into the uh, uh, 
it's, it's a early cases of uh, uh, case of strider where uh, you don't hear the noise but you can feel the noise let me we take it up when you are uh, uh, going to examine the patient okay so you have a disease most probably it's a progressive disease most probably it's a uh, malignant disease arising from the larynx probably at the level of the glottis that will be your um, uh, your idea about this disease okay continue general examination a patient is conscious oriented moderately built and moderately nourished uh, no pilar not icteric uh, clubbing was present uh, you think no patient is you think patient is moderately nourished I have not seen the patient, but uh, you, you say the patient has got a, a loss of weight for about one month's duration. So what is built, what is nourishment? Uh, nourishment is uh, amount of subcutaneous uh, fat, sir. That is, nourishment is the short term. Uh, uh, it's it's a short term will be. Built is long term will be. The patient who is not taking proper uh, nutrient for a long time from the childhood, that build will be smaller. Patient who has lost weight recently, they will have a poorly nourished. So that you got to, to check it up again. Okay, right then. Uh, no pedal edema, no generalized lymphadenopathy. So what, uh, what else you should, okay, right. Vitals, uh, um, pulse rate was 86 per minute. BP was 130 or 80. Uh, saturation was uh, 98% at room app. Okay. Examination of throat. Uh, oral Examination of oral cavity. Upper lip, lower lip. Go to the uh, hypopharynx larynx. Yeah, indirect larynx to be examined. Okay. Uh, posterior one third of uh, tongue was normal. Bilateral pharyngo epiglottic pool. A median glossoepiglottic pool are normal. Epiglottis normal. Bilateral uh, area epiglottic pool normal. Right arytenoid was normal. Uh, left arytenoid has impaired mobility. So right fa false cord normal. Left false cord had impaired mobility. True cords, uh, uh, left true cord, pink irregular proliferative growth, which vis uh, visualized involving the entire length of uh, left cord. Involving anterior commissure and also extending till uh, anterior two third of right vocal cord with the uh, impaired mobility on the left side. So left again, you are sure it's an impaired mobility or it's not mobile? Not mobile. Why impaired mobility? Okay. When do you when do you call a patient who got an any larynx issues and when do you when do you call a patient as the um, uh, when do you call the, the patient as uh, left cord is fixed? Sir, when the arytenoids and AE4 false cord and uh, uh, true cords are uh, 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 fixed, we, we call it uh, hemilarynx fixity. Okay. And, you so, sure that uh, Left vocal cord, I mean, left false cord, there is no bulge. Okay. So, left uh, AE fold and arytenoid was very much. You see, there. you see this. You see the left ventricular band, it's a little pushed up. Okay. So, uh, irregular growth involving entire length of the left vocal cord and anterior one third of the right vocal cord uh, involving anterior commission. So left hemilarynx okay. is fixed. Okay. Glottic chink was adequate, sir. What is the rhyme of glottis? What is glottic chink? Uh, space between the... Uh... The airway between the two vocal cords is called glottic chink. And then the edge of the vocal cord is called rhyme of glottis. Okay, fine. Then, present. 
So examination of neck, uh, laryngeal contour was normal, crepitus was normal, uh, no tenderness, uh, airway adequate, patient not in strider, trachea midline, and no palpable limb node was seen. Trachea, did you palpate for the strider? Yes, sir. Was the patient having strider? No, no, sir. No, no tracheal thrill. You should you should palpate all these patients with your with your finger, thumb, and then you got to use your step and uh, and look for uh, and should hear for the thrill. Okay. The yeah, mildest form of vibrating air column will be felt or it will be heard with your uh, stethoscope on the trachea. Only if it becomes bigger, you get the uh, uh, strider. Okay, that you should have done. Next, examination was uh, examination of ear. Ear no, ear no, anything significant? No, sir. No, right then. And the systemic examination, uh, cardiovascular system, S one, S two present. Uh, RS bilateral uh, uh, breath sounds equal. No added sounds. Uh, um, per abdomen, uh, no hepatosplenomegaly or any organomegaly. Uh, CNS, no focal neurological deficit and uh, spine and skull normal. Okay. What's your diagnosis? Uh, malignant growth uh, larynx, subsite uh, glottis, uh, stage T3, N0, N0. Clinical stage 3. Clinically, it is stage three. Clinically, stage three. I mean, see, uh, clinically, T three. Okay, right, fine. Uh, why do you say it's a malignant growth? Sir, uh, because uh, uh, the symptoms are uh, progressive and uh, non-remitting. Ideological factor of. Uh, Smoking and alcohol was present. Listen, 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 listen. You are sitting on an exam. All your examiners are all old. Most of your examiners smoke and take alcohol. So you go tell this first to them. They'll get offended. They will come and ask you. I am old. I am 50 plus. I take alcohol. I smoke. Do, do you mean to say I get get malignancy? But the but the. The sad truth is that if somebody comes and asks you on the road, you will say, you idiot, if you smoke, you will take alcohol, you, are, you, you, will, you will get malignancy, but you can't tell that in an exam. Right? So don't tell these things at all as the first point. In an examination, all, see, the patient can bluff. Patient can tell lies to you. So what is more important, what do you see? So first thing you see, the signs of malignancy in a tumor is, you see the surface of the tumor. The proliferative irregular tumor with the averted margin extending along the facial plane from one cord to the opposite cord involving an anterior commission. Okay, and a deeper infiltration with vocal cord fixity. So a fixed cord always says there is a deeper infiltration. An infiltrative lesion is the malignancy. A tumor appearance. It's a proliferative. Actually, you see that surface. It is a little warty. What the hypercarotid proliferative growth involving the entire length of the vocal cord with a mild bulge on the uh, left uh, uh, vestibular vestibular folds go to an anterior commissure and come to the opposite cord and uh, with a deeper infiltration muscular infiltration causing vocal cord fixity. Okay, so if you see a tumor like this, you always say this is the Malignant tumor. And then it, it has got a symptoms, one year unremitting uh, symptoms with the um, uh, uh, loss of weight, loss of appetite. And then patient is having a, uh, it suckers on a patient who is uh, who is elderly, who smokes and takes alcohol for long duration. This is most probably it's a malignant tumor. So how will you confirm this uh, malignancy? A microlaryngeal examination and biopsy. You do microlaryngeal examination straight away. Will you do it straight away or do any other investigation before that? Uh, 
answer the uh, routine blood investigations nothing is routine in exam so you do total Tot count differential total count, count. differential total count, 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 uh, count renal function test okay a liver function test sir. and uh, uh, x-ray like uh, x-ray okay you want to take x-ray next okay uh what you what view you want to take both ap lateral ap and lateral ap lateral uh, what way it is important what can you see on x-ray next sir um the extent of uh, lesion sir airway whether it is adequate or not okay this and patient has got a difficult yeah. this patient has got a difficulty in breathing so this patient might require tracheostomy in in a recent future particularly if the patient develops strider so you want to know the lower extent of the, the disease can be found by the x ray and also by the um, uh, you want to see the tracheal position okay and uh, associated second primary for this x ray is important what other x ray you will take so the x ray chest uh, to look for so, any metastasis so, or... so you can do but uh, nowadays we don't take these x rays instead we go for the ct scan uh, ct c ct neck and the c and the x uh, and the chest why you want to image the chest to look for any uh, metastasis sir and also associated uh, any, uh, any copd associated with the uh, since uh, the patient is a chronic smoker so pulmonary function may be compromised so, so for that purpose uh, we are taking it okay x-ray chest uh, x uh, imaging the x-ray is taken is a pilot examination because you are going to treat the patient for a long time the patient might develop anything it can develop another uh, another shadow in future so you want to just check it whether that shadow is before there or not so for that you got to take the x uh, you got to image the chest it's called a pilot film so every, the c c t neck and this thing is the pilot film uh, uh, even your uh, microlingual examination got to be recorded okay these are all pilot studies because if you see a small tumor uh, which you you think it's only a, uh, a benign tumor you take biopsy once you take biopsy excise it completely and send for uh, uh biopsy and biopsy comes as squamous cell carcinoma what do you do you there is a so scenario you do a, a microlingual examination you see a mid third focal cord there is some polypoidal growth you take biopsy once you take the biopsy uh biopsy report came as the squamous cell carcinoma what do you do Sir, if the margins are clear, uh, I'll follow up the patient. Sir. Or else, uh, RT will be No, the thing is, how will you follow up the case? The will you do any? Will you do any imaging? C C T. Why? What for? Sir, uh, Very small lesion. The... It's on the, only on the on the vocal cord, medial surface. Looks like a brain tumor. You cannot see. mucosal diseases you got to keep that in your mind is diagnosed to only with your examination maybe a direct examination or an indirect examination not by your x-rays not by your your images images are all used only for the deeper penetration images are used only for the deeper penetration but the idea is before treating a treatment for this patient everything got to be recorded everything got to be the recorder that is very very important so oh, this is the recording of the image of the chest so that is the pilot a pilot examination second is to rule out the secondary third is second primary fourth is mediastinal extension mediastinal nodes fifth is to see the uh, to see the aspiration pneumonitis okay so uh, pilot film secondary Second primary, five percent of the adenic malignancies are always associated with the uh, uh, second primaries. Okay, then uh, uh, cardiac uh, anesthetic purpose, cardiac evaluation, chest evaluation. All these patients have have got a 
uh, associate because of the poor nutrition patient can have an associated copd or patient can have a cavitatory lesion in the lung so the uh, cavitatory lesion can have inside that uh, the cavity uh, cavity lesion because of an immunocompromised patient can have a fungal ball all these things can be diagnosed with your uh, imaging okay so oh, first thing is pilot film second is uh, second is third is second primary fourth is uh, any uh, media channel uh, uh, lymph nodes aspiration pneumonitis uh, then uh, you look for uh, cardiac uh, cardiac assessment look for uh, uh, um, lung assessment look for copd or associated uh, tuberculosis there is a cavity inside that cavity and recently with uh, uh, the uh, with an advent of covid it will give you an idea about that covid score also okay so all these things are advantages of chest chest screening then ct neck what ct you will take C C T neck, C C T neck, multi-direction, uh, uh, multi-planar, planar C T. What are all things you will look for? Extent of lesion, sir. Uh, whether it okay. is extending to paraglottic space and pre-epiglottic space. Uh, okay. Whether it is extending to subglottis. Okay. And uh, neck nodal status, sir. Okay. Cartilage invasion. okay so important for three things one is for the deeper invasion like cartilage invasion second is for the um, geography of the, the tumor where are all the, the tumor spread into the, the paraglottic space arytenoid cartilage subglottic area ventricle uh, false vocal cord all these areas you can see third is the uh, neck nodes how does the node look like look like on a ct scan how will you differentiate a benign node from a Malignant node. Sir, uh, uh, round in shape, sir. Whether a reactive node is elliptical in shape, and uh, loss of fatty hilum and uh, increased uh, cortical echoes. Sometimes calcification may be present. And, uh, extra capsular spread. Ah, extra capsular spread causing irregular surfaces. These are all the important points to differentiate a node from the size. Yeah, the node usually about one millimeter, one uh, centimeter in size, and except in the uh, jugular diagnostic, where the jugular diagnostic it will be one point five centimeter. If it is more than that, it is a significant node. Okay, so you do the C C T. Okay, then what else you do? Any other yes. investigation you do? the pulmonary function test will you do an mri will do an mri yes sir why better evaluation of the uh, uh, nodal status cartilage invasion and the extent of the tumor because it's a soft tissue tumor only so this is can be uh, seen better any other test you do pet scan uh only pet or pet ct pet ct pet ct is for the complete evaluation of the meds okay always you do a the pet ct uh, doppler uh, uh, and uh, neck examination with the uh, uh, with the ultrasound this of not much use particularly in the case of a ca larynx okay you do a stroboscopy stroboscopy is of no use when you see a such a big tumor like this when the stroboscopy is useful is when you have a very small tumor you don't know whether it's a benign tumor or a malignant tumor benign diseases that in, doesn't invade the uh, intermediate layer the uh, malignant tumor invades intermediate and the deep layers of lamina papyria uh, uh, lamina papyria so when you do a stroboscopy you look for the wave pattern when the wave pattern is absent or wave pattern uh, pattern is impaired you will think it is a, a deeper invading tumor 
the deeper invading tumor can produce uh, um, uh, it can be due to a, a malignancy okay that is stroboscopy anything else you do there are a lot of things you will do a lot of things we read we read like uh, we start doing video laryngoscopy then you do a sort of stroboscopy and then most of the things what we read is not available in india like uh, video chymography optical <laughs> optical current uh, tomography and then you have things like uh, sort of nba nba is a useful this thing it's all for the screening purpose or to uh, take out the smaller smaller lesion to see whether it is benign or uh, or malignant nba you look for vasculature it is assumed that a malignant tumor gets a lot of neovascularization so you get a lot of blood vessels but uh, that will give you an idea they said it is as correct as it of a 98% of the uh, sensitivity but the problem is can you going to do a radical surgery on a patient seeing on only only on mba it can be used as a screening tool to take biopsy but it's not a full proof okay uh that's what i told you now okay then uh, second thing is uh contact endoscopy and uh, confocal uh, uh, endoscopies are all used okay it can be used but all is nothing is a replacement for dl scopy biopsy i mean uh, microlensial examination and biopsy okay before that you got to uh, rule out the Uh, second primary those days we used to take a barium swallow okay barium swallow one of the important things of barium swallow is you can see from the side the mobility of the larynx particularly in the hypopharyngeal growth whenever there is a pre uh, pre vertebral infiltration larynx will not move when the larynx don't move that's a case you should not operate because pre vertebral invasion is the contraindication to do a radical surgery so second thing is you can you can look for uh, second primary lower extent of the tumor if it's an hypopharyngeal uh, tumor mainly in the case of a ca larynx barium swallow is done to rule out second primary similarly you do a triple endoscopy you do a bronchoscopy esophagoscopy and this thing all these things are all do to do a to rule out second primary which can be uh, taken out by a one investigation that is pet ct You do a you do a pet ct all these things are all need not be done okay when you do a microlensial examination what are all things you will look for microlensial examination is not to take biopsy alone microlensial examination is done to take to see the tumor map the tumor whatever imaging you see if you think there is a tumor has got a lateral extension it got a uh, subglottic extension you can retract the retract the tumor and see how far it has gone up how far it has gone anteriorly whether anterior commission is involved or not all these things you can see okay then uh, you can palpate the tumor you see whether the tumor is uh, or firm or it is very hard the hard tumors will have a poor blood supply and these poor blood supply tumor will not respond much for a radiotherapy then you can take biopsy biopsy can be taken geographically from the margin from the center of the tumor various places see two lobules you can take from two lobules and label all these things so all these things cannot be done when you do a uh office biopsy procedures even though if you do an office biopsy procedures video laryngoscopy biopsies it's always safe to do a microlensial examination under general anesthesia okay then you see the um, mobility of the cord you see whether the uh, probe test for a uh, uh, thyroid joint involvement all these things can be done with a microlensial examination okay so once you are you are you are done you will know what is the uh, staging of the tumor what is the plan okay this tumor is an advanced tumor what do you think this tumor uh, how does the ca larynx spreads where does the glottic tumor starts focal cord squamous epithelium vocal cord and the lamina propria okay the tumor spreads along the superficial layer of lamina propria from uh, the uh, uh, 
mid court to the anti rate commissioner and to the vocal process once it goes to the vocal process uh, see there are lot of barriers called anatomical barriers embryological barriers and the uh, mechanical barriers and uh, also chemical barriers so uh, the both vocal cords takes separately and and comes to the midline why vocal cord is the common area of our uh, malignancy is there is a squamous squamous columnar junction at two areas okay one is anteriorly other one is posteriorly i mean one is uh, laterally other one is medially so supraglottis has got a, a stool satipate ciliary columnar subglottis has got a stool satipate ciliary columnar joining area you will have this squamous columnar the junction which is vulnerable for the malignant formation so where does the malignancy starts starts in the area called rinky space rink what are the boundaries of rinky space uh, the anterior uh, su uh, superiorly superior arcuate line inferiorly inferior arcuate line anterior commissure and uh, posterior commissure anteriorly anterior commissure posteriorly posterior commissure or vocal process okay so what is the uh, what is the medial boundary lateral boundary um medial boundary is the uh, free border of vocal cord lateral boundary is by the vocalis muscle okay how do you get a superior boundary and an inferior boundary at the same time you get a medial and lateral boundary uh, movement of uh, vocal cords when the vocal cords are in uh, abducted position uh, uh, in uh, superior and inferior arcuate lines uh, see when a vocal cord closes in in midline like this by closes in uh, midline like this you have a uh, medial boundary lateral boundary but when the, the vocal cords goes laterally it goes like this so you have a superior boundary and inferior boundary superior boundary is a superior arcuate line inferior boundary is an inferior arcuate line superior arcuate line is the junction of the beginning of ventricle lower border of ventricle to the vocal cord inferior arcuate line is the medial border which goes laterally like that so it's a submucosal space which uh, which contains loose areola tissue it's called a uh, superficial layer of lamina papilla it's anteriorly it's go to anterior commissure uh, posteriorly goes to the uh, vocal process medially free border laterally the vocalis muscle it's a submucosal space where the tumor enters first from there it spreads easily because no resistance to anteriorly and posteriorly once it goes deeper it involves the ligament and the uh, set of musculature it prevents the vocal cord free movements uh, under mucosal wave pattern so this called the fixity what are all the causes of fixity of the vocal cord sir uh, uh, it may be due to tumor bulk uh infiltration of uh, thyroid muscle or uh, infiltration of uh, recurrent meningeal or it may be because of the fixity of the vocal cord okay i mean sorry fixity of the cricoretinoid joint okay so uh, uh if it goes to an anterior commission it got stops by the broil's ligament so broil's ligaments prevent it to spread to the opposite cord but the problem with the, the broil's ligament is the uh, closest attachment to the um, uh, uh, the cartilage is there is a devoid of pericondrium pericondrium is the good barrier for the the tumor uh, prevention of tumor spread the insertion area that is a uh, the blood vessels goes inside that cartilage uh, blood vessels goes inside and there is a devoid of pericondrium so it can easily spread to the uh, anterior commissure whenever the tumor go to the anterior commissure it can uh, it can spread about 1 uh, cm about towards the petiole of epiglottis and also to the, the subglottic area where the tumor can become a supraglottic glottic and subglottic so all the anterior commissure tumor involves all three all three areas so it got to be carefully um, uh, staged as uh, tumor staged okay similarly 
once it goes to there whenever the the cartilage is ossified uh, that can easily easily it can it can get involved it can it can got eroded so the cartilage invasion will cause pericondrium uh, can get infected can become uh, patient can develop pericondritis or even patient can develop tenderness okay so once it involves the petiole of epiglottis you got to be careful about the uh, uh, there will be a lot of pits in the uh, infra ai part of epiglottis which can transmit the tumor to the tumor uh, to the pre epiglottis space what are the boundaries of pre epiglottis space uh, so superiorly uh, hyo epiglottic ligament Infer uh, inferiorly thyro epiglottic ligament uh, posteriorly uh, the infra hyoid epig uh, epiglottis and uh, it communicates uh, laterally with the uh, uh, paraglottic space and inferiorly thyrohyoid membrane superiorly uh, you get the hyoepiglotticus hyoepiglotticus ligament okay posteriorly infra hyoid part of the epiglottis anteriorly by the thyrohyoid membrane and the part of thyroid cartilage laterally it communicates with the paraglottic space okay so this contains the fat particularly whenever there's a supraglottic tumor the tumor can easily go inside the pre epiglottic space when there it goes to the paraglottic space and becomes a uh, amylaryngeal growth so yeah, whenever the, the pre epiglottis is involved you can't leave the you can't the you can't treat the patient segmentally you want to to treat the patient at the whole laryngeal involvement okay what are the boundaries of paraglottic space Uh, so the um, medially uh, quadrangular membrane, uh, conus elasticus, and uh, it encircles the ventricle. Laterally, uh, thyroid cartilage and thyrohyoid membrane, uh, and uh, superiorly it extends from the pharyngoepiglottic fold and the mucosa uh, covering the valvula. Um, no, 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 no. Mucosa, mucosa covering valvula is not the uh, superior boundary. Superiorly by the airy epiglottic fold. Superiorly airy epiglottic fold, medially uh, conus uh, quadrangular membrane, ventricle and conus elasticus. The ventricle invades into the paraglottic space laterally by the thyroid membrane and the thyroid cartilage. Okay, so uh, so this is the. Uh, um, um, posteriorly anterior obstruction of the pipum fossa okay. this is the uh, uh, this is the if you take a pin and prick the the valvula from above where it goes inside is the pre epiglottic space similarly you take the pin pin and prick the uh, uh, pipum fossa where it where the pin goes inside is the paraglottic space okay so three important spaces the uh, space of boyer and tucker which is the pre epiglottic and uh, the paraglottic space and then you have the um, uh, ringy space okay so what is the transglottic tumor so uh, tumor which traverses the ventricle which involves the paraglottic space which uh, involves the anterior commission so the tumor which involve which it travels from the supraglottic to uh, supraglottic to glottis or glottic to supraglottis is called the transglottic tumor usually these tumors fill the uh, because it is close to the ventricle it will go inside the paraglottic space early and fix the vocal cord early when you look at the when you do a, in, and they have a neck metastasis early and when you look inside the tumor will the patient will not the, there'll be a bulge on the on the ventricle like this patient what you have shown there is a bulge on the left uh, <laughs> ventricular band that is because of filling of the paraglottic space so this if there is a tumor primarily in the paraglottic space uh, paraglottic space area you don't even see the tumor outside well but you have a early vocal cord fixation because of the uh, vocalis muscle infiltration so a tumor which traverses the ventricle which involves supraglottis glottis and known to involve all three areas filling the para, going to the paraglottic space early fixing the vocal cord early and can have a aggressive tumor which can have a neck metastasis is called the uh, is called the uh, 
paraglottic tumor it doesn't matter where the where the tumor uh, tumor starts from it can usually as you know the commonest tumors are all the the glottic tumor so a glottic tumor can go to the uh, um, yeah, the glottic tumor can can go to the the supraglottis if you see the tumor in your indirect laryngoscopic examination most probably that's a glottic tumor if you don't see the tumor it's most probably it's a supraglottic tumor which is coming to the the glottic area okay uh, so how do you take the uh, how do you see uh, see the tnms uh, tnm classification of this patient this patient it is t3 sir T1 is uh, uh, T1 is uh, involvement of vocal cord with uh, a normal vocal cord mobility. T1A is uh, involvement of one vocal cord. T1B is involvement of uh, both vocal cord with or without uh, involvement of anterior commission. T2 is uh, uh, lesion involving uh, uh, extending to supraglottis or subglottis with impaired vocal cord mobility. So T3 is uh, um, uh, lesion limited to larynx. Uh, with uh, spread to uh, uh, paraglottic space, inner perichondrium of uh, thyroid cartilage uh, with the hemilarynx fixity. Uh, T4A is uh, 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 T4A is when the disease extends to, uh, to the uh, locally uh, moderately advanced local disease. So the early, early extends to uh, early advanced disease. It's called now as early advanced disease. T4A so is the, early advanced disease, extralaryngeal spread, cartilage invasion, uh, thyroid cartilage invasion, thyroid cartilage invasion coming out to the neck. How does the tumor come outside? Where does the tumor fix the record value now? Sir. What is cricothyroid triangle? Through the cricothyroid membrane. Uh, the tumor goes to membrane, cricothyroid membrane, cricothyroid membrane, cricothyroid muscle, and the thyroid cortex forms a triangle called a cricothyroid triangle. That's the weakest point through which the tumor comes out. Once the, once the tumor comes out, it infiltrates the, the recurrent genome before it enters the larynx. Okay. Um, then, when will you call a uh, what is T4B? T4B is when the tumor involves uh, free vertebral fascia, uh, in case it's carotid or uh... or going far away places like uh, tongue uh, goes to the mediastinum, then you call a very advanced tumors. Okay. So, uh, are you? What are you going to do to this patient? Sir, so, uh, uh, T three, we can go in for uh, go for uh, organ conservation strategies like uh, chemo. How do you know it is T three? Sir, so, uh, hemilarynx fixity. Breathe, Sharma. Vertical partial laryngectomy. Vocal cord is not fixed. The vocal cord is fixed in the patient. And it involves both cuts. How do you do a vertical partial laryngectomy? Yeah, you are not sure which is which is T3 now. Your CT scan will, will tell you whether there is a cartilage invasion or not. Okay. Uh, Varun, no Varun. Total rectectomy will be done only when, the, when you prove that it's an early advance. Okay, so early, so T3 is a controversial. So you can do whether you want to do an organ preservation or organ uh, uh, organ preservation, or you want to do a radical radical treatment. If you want to do an organ preservation, you should you should have the functioning larynx. Okay, so what are the functions of the larynx? Sir, uh, spindrick uh, action, sir. Uh, by the spindrick three-tier spindle mechanism, it prevents okay. the foreign body entry and aspiration, sir. Uh, okay. Cough reflex, uh, chest uh, fixation of chest. It uh, okay. aids in breathing. Uh, okay. It aids in circulation by uh, facilitating
ఇట్ ఎయిట్స్ అండ్ డెగ్లూటిషన్ మ్యూకోసిలియరీ క్లియరెన్స్ మెకానిజం ఫోనేషన్ అండ్ ఎమోషన్ ఎమోషనల్ ఫోనేషన్ బట్ వాట్ యు హావ్ మిస్డ్ ది కాండిట్ ఇట్ యాక్సెస్ అ కాండిట్ ఫర్ ఆర్ ఫస్ట్ టు ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఫంక్షన్స్ వన్ ఇస్ ది స్పింట్రిక్ ఫంక్షన్ వేర్ ఎనీథింగ్ ఫ్రమ్ అబౌట్ డజంట్ గో ఇన్సైడ్ what it goes inside your your food pipe doesn't go inside at the same time it opens up the airway airway it functions as a conduit so that air goes inside and come out so both the things are all very important so because air goes and comes because it closes you have another additional function called the phonation which is phylogenetically not so important function all other functions are all important functions like fixation chest fixation cough reflexes or other protective to reflexes mucociliary preclearance pulmonary so all these things so end expiratory pressure is maintained because of the uh, patients who have got a larynx closes if the larynx doesn't close the end expiratory pressure cannot be maintained if you don't maintain the end expiratory pressure the peripheral alveoli will not get open let's say when you do a do a tracheostomy there's a possibility of a peripheral collapse and the patient can have a mild uh, pneumonitis similarly whenever there is a uh, inspiration there is a negative pressure in the thorax and it aids in venous retention so these are all the additional things which is helpful for the life so when the patient you do a tracheostomy and the patient doesn't have a functioning larynx then there is no point in doing an organ preservation you understand if the t3 lesion when your larynx is functioning there is no tracheostomy you can go for an organ preservation if there is the already function is lost you don't think of organ preservation even in early advanced cancers you go for ccd okay early advanced cancers you can go for a ccd but uh, uh, early advanced cancers if there is a, similarly again there is a, uh, i mean you you go for uh, chemotherapy but uh, if there is a laryngeal function already lost there is no point in going for organ preservation you can go for a radical surgery okay so uh, what are all the indications for total laryngeal uh, sir uh, malignant uh, indication non malignant and uh, miscellaneous malignant indication uh, t4a lesion involving the thyroid cartilage and uh, lesion involving uh, cricoid cartilage uh, and uh, uh, the radio recurrent uh, tumors uh, it can be done as a salvage uh, uh, procedure and uh, in in patients who have with the uh, failed initial uh, laryngeal conservation surgeries we can go for a, a total a salvage total laryngectomy uh, and a patient uh, malignant uh, patient with malignancy who has got a compromised laryngeal function like a patient presenting with a strider or aspiration we can go for a total laryngectomy and also uh, yeah tumor what is incontinuity what what is the incontinuity resection when you when you doing for a radical surgery is like when you do a, a total ring of ring out is a pharyngectomy you can't leave be in larynx alone or if you are doing a total total pharyngectomy then you got to do along with it you got to take the larynx okay other things are all like uh, the tumors which is not amenable for radiotherapy radio recurrent tumors radio residual tumors tumor which is not amenable for for radiotherapy and when you are planning for a some other procedure for example you do a bilateral uh, neck dissection when you do a such a huge procedure along with it you can you can remove larynx also when you doing a total laryngectomy or any laryngeal surgery which gives that uh, surgical cure you can do this okay so these are all the uh, uh, indications to do a total laryngectomy okay so uh, and a patient who have got a compromised laryngeal function chronic aspiration um, so these are all the patients who whom you do a per total laryngectomy see assume this patient will think of doing a total laryngectomy right what are all the pre operative work of you will do um so the pre anesthetic uh, fitness uh, for the purpose of anesthetic fitness uh, uh, cardiac status and uh, echocardiogram pulmonary function test how do you do pulmonary function test you do a tracheostomy to the patient
you have a separate valve for that to do a pulmonary function test. Okay, then what else you do? Psychological assessment, psychiatrist opinion. These people are bound to go for a, a severe depression after after losing the speech function. Then you send the patient for speech therapy. And then you, you try to give some soda to the patient, ask them to belch so that the patient can uh, develop esophageal voice in the post-operative. If they are not fit for that, then you can plan for it, uh, doing a primary TEP. Okay, these are all, uh, and then you get a dermatologist opinion, you get a dental opinion to rule out focal sepsis. Okay, you got to do the uh, complete liver function test, renal function test, cardiac evaluation, uh, uh, pulmonary evaluation. With all these things done, you got to take the patient for surgery. Okay, and then the most important thing is you got to do an informed consent. What is informed consent? You got to realistically talk with the patient about the what are all the drawbacks the patient is going to have. Patient can't do a sternus exercises. It would have been a lorry driver. It's very difficult for him to drive a lorry, particularly without uh, uh, power steering when, him, uh, uh, when he has uh, 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 undergo total reading. The chance for foreign body, foreign body going inside, chances for drowning, chances for him to not be able to take uh, normal head bath and normal physical activities. Okay, so all these things you got to sit with the patient, talk and make him understand. And the family also need to understand these requirements now. The uh, recent situation. Once you have done all these things, you can take up the patient for surgery. Long time back when we know we were uh, uh, operating on a on a patient, some when I was a so postgraduate, we were operating on a patient. The patient was uh, uh, somewhere from Orissa. And he doesn't know that uh, uh, local language. So we were talking in English only with his uh, um, son, son and family members. So we have counseled them well and under surgery. After that surgery, when he just caught up, the first question he asked is, when will I talk? So you got to talk with the patient on his local language, the language what he understands, not in our language or uh, not in English. When the patient don't understand, it's always uh, very troublesome. Okay. So then, uh, in the previous days, what are all things you will check? Your checklist, what are all things you will check for? Check for? I think uh, the people who just come from bigger hospitals or the, the people who always do cases, uh, uh, total laryngectomies, it's a sort of routine for them. For the people who do occasionally the total laryngectomies, because in the very small uh, small colleges and small district headquarters hospitals, you should have a, have a checklist. You should have a biopsy report in the front page. You should have a blood report. I mean, blood grouping and uh, uh, typing. Then you should have you should check for the uh, uh, tube, Foley's catheter. Check for uh, uh, whether you have a cuffed endotracheal tube. Okay, and then uh, flexometallic tube for uh, endotracheal intubation. If you do a tracheostomy, you have another uh, another flexometallic tube. All these things you should keep ready. Then only you should uh, take the patient for surgery. Okay, before taking the patient. You should do a, uh, how will you do total laryngectomy? What incision you will make? What are all the steps of total laryngectomy? Yes, sir, uh, incision, incision. What incision? Sir, plexor and some incision, sir. Sir, if the uh, previous tracheostomy is not done, uh, stomal, um, uh, the site for the stoma is marked between, in midway between the uh, thyroid uh, notch and the suprasternal notch, sir. And then uh, from the midline, a curvilinear incision extending uh, along the anterior border of the sternocleidal mastoid till the mastoid tip is made, sir. And uh, okay. subplatysmal flap is uh, elevated, sir. Subplatysmal flap. Okay. Blood sounds incision is the common incision we use. But uh, nowadays, there is a lot of uh, incisions used. You can use a uh, skin piece incision and other separate incision for the uh, uh, tracheostoma 
or uh, you can use a uh, jetson uh, sensation if you do a, um, a radical neck dissection you can use a sort of act, uh, artistic incision or whatever it is okay so when from if you do a bilateral neck dissection one sternum uh, one mastite process to another mastite process commonly uh, bringing along the anterior border of sternum mastite encircling the the tracheostome you can elevate an apical flap uh, you, you can elevate a, the flap down and still you can do a uh bilateral uh mrnd okay then uh, uh if you do a only total anatomy have you assessed the total anatomy yes okay, so uh, uh once you make the uh, elevate the the apron flap and fix the flap to the to the skin what do you do next Sternocleidomastite. Sternocleidomastite. You make an incision along the anterior border of sternocleidomastite. Open up the uh, uh, visceral vascular visceral vascular layer to to look for secondaries and operability. That's the first thing you will do. Check for operability. If there is a node, you do the uh, MRND. If there is no neck node, you just proceed to do a, a total right away. So you you elevate the the investing layer what is the first muscle you will identify and uh, like it omohyoid first to identify the omohyoid at the uh, uh, from under the, the sternocleidomastoid mastoid on, on both sides then strap muscles so you will you will like it the sternohyoid and the uh, sternohyoid sternothyroid and cut them then release them then what do you do next Depends upon the vascular is what? The vascular particles are identified and like it as a. You are going to remove the. You are you are going to remove the thyroid or not? Okay, if you are you are preserving both the thyroids, you anchor the thyroid on the inferior pedicle, remove the superior pedicle, and if there is little thyroid vein, and separate it and anchor it on the. Lower down so that once you you finish the total anatomy you can uh, uh, replace it or what you do is you whenever there if you uh, uh, suspect a uh, uh, extra uh, laryngeal spread that side thyroid you got to sacrifice do a uh, remove all the uh, uh, ligate all the thyroid pedicle and the opposite side you can you can preserve. If you suspect both side thyroid, which is involved with the tumor, uh, particularly if there is a thyroid malignancy extending into the, the larynx or laryngeal malignancy extending into the thyroid, then you have to do a total thyroid. Again. Okay. So you address thyroid. Then what do you address? So, uh, suprahyoid strap uh, muscles. Uh, Why you want to go for suprahyoid first? You are not finished your intrahyoid dissection. What is the other attachment of thyroid to the uh, the pharynx? Thyropharyngeus. Uh... Thyropharyngeus muscle. So thyropharyngeus muscle, you got to uh, dissect the muscle at the lateral border of the uh, uh, lateral border of the um, uh, thyroid cartridge and release the superior carno. Okay. Then you you identify the uh, midpoint of the thyroid. Uh, Thyroid membrane for the entry of the uh, uh, superior laryngeal pedicle. Once you ligate the superior laryngeal pedicle, superior laryngeal pedicle, thyropharyngeus muscle, then you have the thyroid, uh, thyroid gland, address thyroid gland, cut the strap muscle, preserve the uh, deep fascia. Once you have done that, your intrahyoid dissection is over. Then you will go for suprahyoid dissection. How will you go for suprahyoid dissection? The uh, senior hyoid. Uh, Inguinal artery got to be preserved, particularly when you are uh, releasing the great run of the uh, hyoid bone. So, how do you do? So, you identify the, uh, the, the hyoid bone, all the suprahyoid, uh, suprahyoid muscles attached to that hyoid bone. So, you separate the 
all these attachments from the pericondrium of the hyoid bone. So if you keep separating, you will release the body of the hyoid bone, then tilt the larynx so that your greater on is uh, exposed also, then release the, the greater on by hugging it. Don't go, go very lateral to that, remove all the attachment, styloid ligament, styloid uh, uh, muscle, hyoglossus, uh, uh, myeloid, all these muscles got to be released. Once you release the larynx, you will know larynx has been mobilized completely. The entry into the larynx can be done by two ways. One is from the suprahyoid area or from the lateral entry. Particularly whenever you have a tumor which involves both parts, it's always preferable to go from the suprahyoid. So how do you how do you do that? Sir, uh, through the valicula. Okay, through the valicula, you enter, hold the epiglottis, cut along the, the epiglottis, area epiglottic fold, preserve as much mucosa as possible, go close to the area epiglottic fold, but at the same time, you can see to that, you give a good cancer clearance, uh, good uh, free tissues, and then uh, join below, join behind the uh, arytenoids. Once you join behind the arytenoids, you make an horizontal incision on the you know, postcricoid area, separate the uh, postcricoid mucosa from the uh, cricoid cartilage. Then you, as you go lower down, you see the uh, first or second ring according to the uh, 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 subglottic extension. You give a two centimeter uh, clearance and then make a horizontal incision and separate the trachea from the esophagus and then release the larynx out. Okay. So once you have done that, how do you suture the um, pharynx? Either you can use a T-shaped T-shaped or you can, can close it linearly. How many layers you will close? Three layers. What is kernel suture? Kernel suture is box type to the suture which we don't practice now. Now what we do is an extra mucosal uh, uh, inverting sutures. So you take extra mucosal sutures, make two layers, one layer on the uh, on the uh, extra mucosal, so that the second layer over the serous layer, and then you keep the tyrophoryngeus muscle on top of that, and then you close uh, the uh, uh, like a, a subcutaneous closure. You take inside out, outside in, and we bury your knot. Okay, once you have done that. Uh, once you have done that, you do the um, uh, trichopharyngeal myotomy. How do you do the trichopharyngeal myotomy? Put your finger inside. You just slip the finger. You see one place it's getting uh, getting constricted. You just keep cutting with the knife so that that mucosa sub bulges. That means all the uh, all this muscle is cut. If you don't do the trichopharyngeal anatomy, patient might have a dysphagia. Okay, so with this, you you fashion the trachea stone. What suture you do for a trachea stone? Half mattress uh, suture, sir. Half mattress sutures, and you you expose the cartilage got to be buried with the skin. So you take a bite on the skin, then you take uh, extra mucosal uh, bite, uh, bite on trachea and again you take the bite on the uh, skin, that's called off mattress, so that the skin closes the trachea stone. Okay, close it all around and then you, there should not be a soft tissue between the cartilage and the skin. If there is soft tissue, the soft tissue will go for contracture and then that will cause the stenosis. Okay, so directly the skin should be on, on par with that of the, uh, the cartilage and just cover the cartilage. Okay, this is called the extra, uh, it's called the off matter suture. Then you suture the, uh, suture the skin keeping two drains, both sides two drains so that if whenever there is a, 
uh, one train is blocked also so other train will be of some use to you okay then what will you do when will you remove uh, what are all the complications expected so sir uh, Generate hematoma wound infection. Carrying the cutaneous vascular. Right tube should be inserted before surgery. Immediate complications. The post-op complications can be cardiac complications. Okay, long surgery. Patient can go for hypokalemia. so always you take an ecg and uh, serum electrolytes to, to to look for hypokalemia you look for ua in the ecg okay then uh, uh, you look for the uh, patient uh, whether there is any uh, uh, lung is expanded completely because uh, there can be Uh, a long tube can go for a single lung ventilation other lung can go for collapse so you just check it up that always whether both the lungs are all uh, uh, expanded well okay then um, from the second day you should do the all the um, uh, basic investigations uh, when will you start orals the right and dive skip feeding from the uh, third day sir uh, if you keep if you keep rails tube you can do it from the third day if you are doing outside if you do a peg you can you can start the uh, start the feeding immediately that is after 6 hours 8 hours you can you can start the feeding because because rails tube goes through the uh, uh, sphincter uh, you can have aspiration so that can that can contaminate the Wound. That's why we we give it after two three days. Okay. Uh, then whenever you start feeding, you can see a increased amount of uh, uh, drain. That is white color fluids comes out of the drain. That is called chyle chyle fistula. fistula. So you can give a, a pressure bandages or you just explore and find the. Uh, find the chyle duct and ligate it. Okay. Then when will you remove the sutures? Sir, uh, next one sutures are uh, removed on the uh, alternate sutures are removed on the seventh day, and uh, all sutures removed on the tenth day, and the stromal sutures on the fourteenth uh, day. Tenth day to fourteenth day, anything. Okay. Then uh, when will you start orals? Um, tenth day. Tenth day, you start orals. Look for uh, pericarditis leak. If there is a leak, manage the leak. Otherwise, you can uh, send the patient uh, uh, to the home on the fourteenth day. Okay. If the patient has got a neck node. What will you do? Post surgery. Uh... Patient with the CA larynx with the neck node, mobile neck node, T3 node. What will you do? Uh, neck dissection, sir. Uh, bilateral uh, level two no, no. level. No, no. Only one side neck node. What will you do? CA CA larynx for a uh, N0 neck. You don't operate. N0 neck treatment is uh, wait and watch only. You don't do a uh, neck dissection. Okay, only when there is supraglottic extension, you think of neck dissection. Otherwise, you don't do neck dissection. Okay. Tell me. Chemo or the? Chemo or the? No, no, no. You do total laryngectomy with the uh, uh, MRND on that side. Okay. Which one you do first? Total anatomy or MRND? MRND. Always you do MRND first. Okay. Uh, so when you do an MRND, where will you will you remove the, the tumor or uh, tumor out completely, or you will remove it along with the the larynx? Sir, uh, this will tell you whether you have seen the surgery or not. 
So when you do a uh, total laminectomy, when you remove the, uh, uh, when you finish the MRND, the MRND specimen needs to be attached to that side thyroid membrane. That side thyroid membrane along with the superior laryngeal, uh, laryngeal pedicle, then complete uh, the, the total laryngectomy and remove the uh, negative section specimen along with the uh, total laryngectomy. Unless you accidentally cut the, uh, uh, the attachment. Okay, so you just remove, you, you just take it out, leave it attached to the larynx and the thyroid membrane uh, near the superior laryngeal pedicle, complete laryngectomy, and then remove it along with the uh, laryngectomy. So, what are all the structures removed in the case of a radical neck dissection? Uh, I uh, so, uh, so sternocleidum is right. Uh, IJV and the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Recurrent laryngeal nerve. Accessory nerve. Accessory. What happened? Accessory nerve. Okay. So, if the, the, why you want to uh, remove the accessory nerve? So uh, there are two types of lymph nodes, jugular lymph nodes and the accessory nerve lymph nodes. So along the, the jugular, nerve, uh, jugular, there is a lot of, lot of lymph nodes are there. Level 2, 2, 3 and 4 are along the, the jugular. So you got to, if it is uh, uh, adherent with the adventitia, there is a, the possibility of a, a secondary tissue along with that is there. So you got to remove the internal jugular vein. So similarly, level 5 nodes are all along the uh, accessory now, so you got to remove the accessory now also, and then uh, where you want to remove the sternocleidomastite for exposure. Okay, sternocleidomastite will prevent visualizing, uh, 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 so uh, removing the sternocleidomastite is only for exposure. Okay, if you are doing an MRND. I mean, sorry, if you are doing a radical negative section. So what is the drawback of removing stenocleidomastite muscle? What the patient will develop? Nothing will happen. Patient will have only a cosmetically flat neck, that's it. Even if you do a MRND, you got to pull the pull the muscle away and then do the do the dissection. So patient might have uh, loss of nerve supply or uh, loss of uh, uh, blood supply. It will go for for contracture. It will go for atrophy. So you will have a inequality on the on the neck. Only cosmetic. Nothing will happen. Okay, if everything goes right, not that carotid blower, but everything will go right, no movements, nothing will happen. Patient will have a, a, a cosmetic defect. What will happen if you, if you remove the genocleidomastite? I mean, sorry, if you remove the accessory nerve. Patient will go for a frozen shoulder. Okay, patient will go for frozen shoulder. That if, if that is the case, patient develops a pain along the along the neck, and uh, patient will go for a frozen shoulder. What's the treatment? Physiotherapy. Okay, you got to regularly do the uh, physiotherapy to improve the. Shoulder function. Okay, then uh, 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 what will happen if you if you remove the internal jugular vein? So removal of one jugular vein raises the uh, uh, brain congestion by two folds, and there will be an increased ICT by by two folds. If you remove both internal jugular veins, patient will go for a uh, increased uh, intracranial level pressure for five times. Okay, so it's not advisable to do the bilateral 
internal jugular vein removal. Okay, so for these reasons, you got to preserve these structures. Okay, so to preserving these structures and removing only the lymphoid tissue is called functional neck dissection or MRND. Okay, MRND you have three types: type one, type two, and type three. Where you it depends upon what you, you do, what you you preserve. Okay, so I told you why you want to preserve these structures. Okay, so this is about the surgical management of CA larynx. What else you do? If the patient is going for chemo RT, what drugs you will give? <clears throat> What chemotherapy will give? No, 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 no. If you see, this is a T three lesion with no cartilage invasion. What will you do? Organ preservation. What do you do? Chemotherapy. What chemotherapy? What are the? What is anterior chemotherapy? What is concurrent chemotherapy? So, what are all the uh, drugs used? You give three cycle of these drugs, like you give a uh, 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 main drugs used are all five fluorouracil, cisplatin, and then uh, uh, drugs like uh, uh, paclitaxel. Okay, so septicemab. Uh, so these drugs will be uh, used for the uh, uh, for anterior chemotherapy or concurrent chemotherapy. Concurrent chemotherapy means they will do it in the uh, uh, periodically uh, every week they can give or they have a uh, have a plan for that. The plan changes from uh, every center. Okay, every center they have their own their own plans. But usually they they give is if it's an anterior chemotherapy they give you give three cycles or if there is a, a concurrent chemotherapy every week they will give uh, five fluorouracil and uh, a, a given particular particular weeks with the assessment of uh, uh, assessment of the uh, sort of response they will give the it's cisplatin and the uh, paclitaxel, right? So how much how much grace they'll give? Sixty to seventy grace. What is the dose? How many grace per day for how many days a week? So one. Tell me, two hundred. Uh, 200, uh, uh, 200 rats uh, per day per for day five for days day. a week. Five days a week. We give two days for rest for the cells to uh, recoup themselves so that all the uh, growing cells will die and all the other cells will, uh, will recover. You give it for six weeks to seven weeks. Okay. That is, you can give. Uh, uh, along with chemotherapy or you give the anterior chemotherapy, reassess the tumor, brand them as a responders and non-responders, then give, give uh, a concurrent or uh, radiotherapy alone. Radiotherapy alone is given for non-responders. Okay, this is about the uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, this is about the uh, radiotherapy. So what are all the advantages of uh, uh, radiotherapy compared to that of surgery. What are the disadvantages? Uh, uh, organ preservation, wise preservation. You will do the step down in staging. You give a uh, radiotherapy, reassess, even if there is a uh, Tumor, that's a uh, residual tumor, you can operate the patient. A tumor which is inoperable can become operable. Okay, so these are all the advantages. Uh, disadvantages that healing will be later. If you give a, a chemotherapy followed by, uh, by surgery, healing will be uh, difficult. If you do surgery first, 
if there is some surgical complication uh, it will postpone the uh, radiotherapy so these are all the advantages and the disadvantages of chemotherapy okay uh, then what are all the drugs which increases the efficacy of the chemotherapy chemotherapy sensitizes sorry radiotherapy uh, sensitizes Uh, metronidazole uh, hyperbaric okay. oxygen okay blood hemoglobin then chemotherapy agents concurrent chemotherapy or induction chemotherapy will uh, uh, sensitize the uh, patient for radiotherapy use drugs like corynebacterium power drugs like um, uh, Uh, metronidazole, levomazole, uh, all these drugs will increase the sensitivity. Okay, so what do you think is the uh, survival rate of the patient? Five year survival rate uh, fifty to sixty percent. Very low, sixty eight to seventy four percent. Okay, that depends. Right? Uh, what are the prognostic factors? Patient factor, disease factor. Okay. So whenever you have a, a squamous disease, you have a, a aggressive tumors like sarcomas. You have a very poor. uh of prognostication then uh, the cartilage invasion uh, subglottic extension large tumor bulk patient who got a large tumor bulk uh, aggressive tumors uh, anaplastic diseases undifferentiated uh, diseases poorly differentiated diseases will have poor prognostic factors most important prognostic factor is the neck node single node We decrease the five-year survival uh, survival rate by one third. Okay, then uh, uh, when you treat the patient, depends upon if you give a chemotherapy, what complications patient develops. Radiotherapy, what complications patient develops. Whether you can can complete the radiotherapy. Radio uh, radiation decreases the tumor. Whether uh, radiation eradicates the tumor, or when you do the do the surgery, how you know, uh, how completely you could remove that surgery. Tumor margins. So all these things are all important for. Uh, Uh, uh prognostication right what are all the uh, uh, complication of radiotherapy sir uh, osteoradial necrosis okay what happened to the eye Stomach. what happened to the spinal cord what happened to the uh, the secreting glands where the, the patient can shave skin sparing so nowadays you get lot of good radio therapeutic units what is imrt imrt is a i think you have become tired intensity modulated radio therapy imrt so where you take the tumor map the tumor on the uh, on the computer that decides you how much rats to be given on all the area you should you should learn about what is frontal what is lateral ports what is multi directional ports how they deliver the ports what is the polymetry uh, how the linac works all these things you should know okay of course they will not ask you in the exam because ca larynx is the exam question, uh, exam case ca larynx you have a lot of things to to ask for so once you once they keep on asking uh, asking a lot of things the treatment part particularly that chemotherapy radiotherapy part will become uh, they last just two three questions and send you off okay okay so yeah 
ஐஸ்வர்யா பேசிட்டு கேக்குதா ஆ கேக்குது சார் ஓகே ஜானகிராம் சார் சார் ஐ அம் ஹியர் சார் யா ஆஷா ஐ திங்க் வி ஹேவ் கம் டு தட் கன்க்ளூஷன் ஆஃப் தி செஷன் சார் 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 ஒன் மினிட் சார் சார் இஸ் ஆன் ஆஸ்கிங் ஆன் ஆண்டோ எஸ் it was very exhaustive everybody became tired not only the <laughs> candidate <laughs> fantastic But, fantastic uh, ground rounds actually actually lot of things we have not covered we have yeah, not yeah. covered about the pre malignant conditions how do you manage pre malignant conditions anatomy so every time we talk we talk about anatomy 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 it was so boring so yeah, yeah. we talk uh, very uh, it should always 